This is Eating Crow with Pete Durand. Thanks for having me on too, man. This is awesome. Appreciate it. And all the LinkedIn stuff that you've been posting, fantastic stuff. I really appreciate that. Well, you know, Jason, it's all genuine. And this is the fun part of the business is doing this podcast. I've got to meet some pretty incredible people. And that's why we're excited to have Jason Van Camp. Uh, I had to write down, folks, Jason's somewhat, and by the way, this is a, this is the Cliff Notes versions of Jason's background. So I'll, I'll do a brief introduction here. So uh, you were the founder of Mission Six Zero, which is kind of what you've done post-military career. Right. But in your military career, you were a Green Beret, uh, West Point grad, MBA, BYU, three Bronze Stars, one with a V for Valor, yeah. if I've got that correct. And I learned something new. Green Berets are the only people that can truly say they're special forces. Everybody else is special ops. Correct. Got that right. I didn't know that. And as well, I'm a civilian. How would I know that? But, I think most uh, people make that mistake, but... Yeah. I'm not going to make it again. And I appreciated it at the point in your book, which we're going to talk about. I'm going to show it up here to the, to the fans at home. Uh, Deliberate Discomfort is the name of this book, which, by the way, triggered me reaching out to Jason and saying, dude, I got to have you on the show. So, um, Jason, I'd like you to kind of, well, first of all, everyone is probably thinking this, but thank you for your service. The stories in this book are pretty humbling for the average person to read. Well, thank you for saying that. It means a lot. And uh, it's always appreciated. You got to appreciate the appreciate, you know, mm -hmm. and then uh, my buddy Leroy Petrie is in the book as well. When people say, thank you for your service, he says, don't let me down. And so it kind of puts, <laughs> puts the pressure on you, you know, to make sure you live a, a wonderful life as a, as a patriot and as an American. I'll take that to heart because I think, uh, I think you guys mean it. Right. And uh, you know, when I, when I read the book, I ha I've, I've told you and I've told some other people, I, I think this is the best book on leadership I've ever read. Man, that hits my heart, man. Thank you for saying that. It means a yeah. lot, especially coming from you. Well, and you've got, are, you haven't even started tapping into the people this is going to reach yet. And we were talking about that before we started recording, but um, we'll talk about how the book is architected. I want you to kind of briefly describe, you know, recap a little bit when you were going through your military career. Yeah. And you decided you were going to, you know, retire. What was it that just inspired you to start Mission Six Zero and then eventually write this book? When I got in the military, I got out because of um, a medical issue that I that just sort of happened to me while I was in Mali, Africa, on one of my last deployments. I, I came down with a seizure disorder, so I started having epileptic seizures, uh, tonic clonic seizures, and. Um, for, for a couple of years, they would, they would happen. I would fall down by my tongue, shake, you know, I'd lose my memory for a little while. And it was just, it was terrible. And eventually um, my chain of command was like, bro, like we've been trying to take care of you for, for over a year now, you know, you can't deploy, you can't jump, you can't even shoot a weapon right now. Cause we can't trust you to not have a seizure. Hell, you can't even drive into work. I had to bring my, my father out to, to my house in Colorado to drive me, to work and pick me up every day was, was a nightmare. And so they said, we're going to medically retire you. And so um, I asked myself, every veteran asked themselves, what's next? Sure. You know, what am I going to do now? And I remember my mother always used to tell me, show me your friends. I'll show you your future. Yep. When I was a kid and I looked around and I saw some of my buddies getting uh, help for mental illness, PTSD. And I thought, you know, I'm okay with that. I don't need, to pursue that angle. So my friends were getting jobs and in investment banking and making a lot of money. And I was like, you know what? I don't know if I'm ready to jump into that. I don't know if I have that passion. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I want to be more creative. I want to I want more than that. And some of my friends had started businesses. One friend in particular had made millions of dollars, a fellow army football linebacker, wow. you know, and he's, a, he's one of my closest friends. And I said, you know what? You know, I, I want to start a business. And I thought if those guys could do it, so could I. And so I started Mission Six Zero, and originally it was named Mission Essential. And I am very passionate about people. And I looked back on my military career and I thought, man, I served with some of the best people on this planet, mm -hmm. you know, commanders, subordinates, peers, and so forth. And I thought, you know, if I could get my kids in a room with these guys and they could just soak up everything that they are, 
mm-hmm. their leadership, their, their mentality, their toughness, their determination and resourcefulness that I would be doing my, my children a, a great service. And so I got together with these individuals and I thought, you know, I told them guys, I want to start a business. And, you know, I've been in the military for since you know, 20 years, since 1995, really. And at West Point, let's start a leadership development business. Granted, guys, I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no idea how to start a business. I'm still going through my MBA program. But if you believe in me, um, let's do it. And so they believed in me and we, we hit the ground running. And our first client ever was the New York Jets. And that's how it started. You know, that's a pretty heady place to start is with an NFL football team. And by the way, the story is in the book about what they did with the Jets. So you got to read the book to catch up on that. Yeah. But in, the reason it's so relevant to have you in this podcast, this podcast is focused on leaders and entrepreneurs. That's, that's our niche, right? And that's my passion. You cover both, right? You're obviously a leader. Your peers are leaders. The leadership lessons in the book are tremendous. But the fact that you just said, I'm going to start a business the first thing you did was reach out to people that you knew would trust you. And it's mentioned in the book how important trust is, right? They said, look, Jason, you're going to figure this out. You know, we're, we're in the foxhole with you, man. Let's go get this done. And writing a book was such a brilliant move because it, it, it forces you to think. It forces you to condense all the information you said that was in their heads yeah. and pull it into a collective narrative and for the folks that haven't read the book, the, the story, and, and Jason, please correct me if I get this wrong, is kind of you taking over a unit and the, 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 is it the major, I believe, has you meet all these different people to help you become a better leader. And it's their stories woven with your story. And it's an excellent way to write the book. I thought it was really fascinating because it's, it's retrospective, right? It's how other people viewed you and they're showing that. And then your impression of what these guys went through and you know this is not a um, this isn't a children's book. <laughs> no, no, there's some serious not. shit going on in this book. And yeah. you know, for for us civilians, I don't know that we appreciate what you go through, what our men and women in the military go through, you know, downline, downrange, and the fact that they're in it, uh, and what that means to come back and deal with it both mentally and physically, as you described. But. Uh, what I, there are other people that have done other podcasts with you that have focused a lot on your military background, and it's it's evident in this book. But when I got inspired, when I reached out to you, I think that the 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 note I put in my message was it's time, right? I read this book and said it's time for us to talk because I I want to help other leaders figure out how to apply the lessons learned in this book in their organizations, and I want them to be comfortable in the discomfort that you're providing. This is putting people in an uncomfortable position. You have to know that every time you learn, you were uncomfortable. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to throw people, you know, into a situation where they can be physically harmed. Right. But mentally and emotionally, they're going to get uncomfortable because they've got to rethink their thought process, which is a whole lot of eating crow. That's kind of the point here. So, Jason, I, I, I wrote down a couple notes, and I'm going to start throwing some ideas by you. Okay. One of the things that I thought was interesting in here is being quiet versus being silent, Mm. right? And as leaders and potential leaders, can you describe the difference between what it means to be quiet and be silent? Yeah. So the, the, the nickname of the green berets is, is the quiet professionals. And if you, when you enter that community, that unit, you know, the Green Berets, you sort of internalize that message. I'm a quiet professional. I'm not going to stand up and, you know, be an embarrassment to my unit or my country. I'm not going to put myself in any position where it's it's going to potentially be a detriment, right? And I think a lot of guys sort of misinterpret that as I can't market myself or talk about myself or or anything like that. Uh, For example, when I was a kid, I was super interested to hear stories from the military guys, from the, from the World War II guys, from the Vietnam guys. And, and I would ask, like, what was it like? You know, and, and a lot of times the answer was like, I don't want to talk about it mm-hmm. or just silence. And I was kind of like, what did they see? What, what did they go through? Why aren't they telling me anything? And it wasn't like I was saying, how many people did you kill or anything mm-hmm. like that? I was just like, can, 
explain to me what it was like. I'm curious. I'm, I'm genuinely interested. And I was met with silence. And that was maybe part of the reason why I joined the military, because I wanted to understand what it was like, what they went through. Mm-hmm. And having gone through what I went through, I, I look back on my career and, and I think, why wouldn't I share this with everybody? I'm not bragging about you know, how many people my team killed or how many, whatever. We're, we're not like that. We're just sharing and being vulnerable and, and, and telling people about what it's like so they can learn, so they can improve, so they can be better at whatever it is they want to be better at. And I think um, when I was at a Green Beret Foundation function, you know, I said, you know, although we're the quiet professionals, we can't be silent professionals. And that really rustled some feathers with some guys. Mm. And I said, listen, like, you know, the Navy SEALs are doing a great job of marketing themselves. Yes, you know, they do. Their, their charities, their foundations are making tons of money. And the Green Beret Foundation was not. And they're like, why aren't we making money? Why are Because nobody knows about you guys. Nobody knows about the Green Berets. And there's a way that you can market yourself in a very professional way where you don't come across the wrong way, mm-hmm. right? And I think about it, I explained it like this to the guys in the room. I said, listen, you have to be an expert marketer as a Green Beret because you have to go to your boss and your boss's boss and pitch them your mission set. Like, sir, this is our slide deck. This is what we want to do over there, over there in country. These are the guys that we have on the team. This is how we're going to do it. And if you believe in me, select my team for the best mission, right? And I didn't go up there saying, hey, sir, let me tell you about Jason Van Camp. Let me tell you how awesome Jason Van Camp is. I didn't say anything about that. I talked about my guys. I talked about my team. And that was very comfortable for me to do that. And I think a lot of guys misinterpret marketing as you need to brag about yourself. You don't. You can talk about your team. You can brag about them. You can talk about how amazing they are and what they bring to the table. And I think in this day and age, you come face to face with something I call FOPO, fear of putting yourself out there Mm -hmm. or fear of people's opinions Mm -hmm. or fear of posting online. All that stuff is, is something that you're afraid of because you're afraid of what other people will think. And when you stop being afraid of that, you know, you can accomplish great things. It's well worded and it applies to a lot of different things in, in the workspace. And, and I'm imagining, and we've gone through this exercise with our leadership team, quiet versus silent, right? When you're silent, it's almost the same thing as consent. Yeah. Right. If I don't speak up and I believe this is wrong, there's a chapter in the book where you talk about um, complainers, right? Yeah. The perception of why is everybody complaining? And what, what, what they said to you is, Jason, they're not complaining. They're demanding perfection. Yeah. Right. They're pointing out things we need to work on and they're going to get resolved. That's your job is to lead them to the point where that complaint turns into a resolution. That's right. So being silent versus quiet, I've heard the same thing. There are times where I'm in meetings and I'm going, geez, it would so much, be so much easier just to say nothing and let this die. Yeah. But it's not my job. My job is to step in, be a leader and resolve that situation, even though I may not be comfortable with what other people will think if I do that. That's right. right. And Another part of the book, and by the way, this was hard for, I had to read this part a couple of times. Okay. And it, it, and it, because it's, it can be, I think, misconstrued as an ego thing. And I'm going to see where I wrote this down. Okay. Um, the, the quote was, when you're in your role at leading a, a unit, you need to lead by commanding. Yeah. Right. The, there should be, no one should ever have to be reminded that you're in charge. Right. And a lot of people want to soften that and say true leaders lead because people want to follow them and they feel good about it. I get all that. But a true leader who has earned the respect of their team doesn't have to remind them who's in charge. If you have to say, hey, look, I'm in charge. I, that's when I, it hit me like that's what they're really trying to accomplish is you don't have to be reminded because you've established that through your behaviors, your actions, because you're serving the person next to you. So there's a lot in there, silent versus quiet and commanding versus leading. So when you're talking to, and we're going to get into some more architecture here. When you're talking to a leader of a company, maybe they're leading a team, maybe they're leading the whole damn company. Okay. And they're struggling. And this, this applies in sports. They're tr- struggling to get people to move in the direction they want them to move. Mm-hmm. How do you break down those lessons from 
your military training into something that the average civilian can digest and process? You know, that's a complicated answer. And I'll tell mm -hmm. you how I would look at it is, is like this. With your kids, with your employees, with your players, you know, a lot of times you tell them the same message over and over again, and they're just not picking it up. Mm -hmm. But if you get somebody new in there saying that same message, all of a sudden the light bulb goes on and it's epiphany. Yes, it and is. Wow, I should be doing this. And you as the boss, you're like, I've been saying this for months. <laughs> like, why didn't you listen? Why did I have to bring this guy in? This? But you need that sometimes. Yeah. You need somebody to come in and, and, and say it differently, just slightly differently in a different tone of voice because, yep. um, you know, <clears throat> like you said, the command presence, you know, it's not an ego thing. Nope. It, it's not an ego thing at all. It's about, you know, you becoming a leader and then getting those scars, mm -hmm. you know, leading your men, um, getting that experience, getting the respect. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're at the point where you're, you're a commander. And sure. to me, that's all about, you know, when somebody walks in the room and they look around at everybody and they're like, who's in charge? Like, they, hey, no question. That dude's in charge. I don't even have to ask. I just feel it. I know yeah. it. That, that, that's the guy right there. It's that yeah. presence. There is a presence. There certainly is. That, and, you know, we talked about page 121 in part of Joe Cerna's story. Yeah. Um, I, I took a picture of this page. I sent it to my team. And, and it focused a lot on emotional intelligence. And it defines emotional intelligence, right? So um, I'm going to read this because it's important. And for the people that will listen here. So – Emotional intelligence is defined as the capacity to efficiently and effectively identify, assess, and manage emotional information. There's so much there. So if you don't have emotional intelligence, you can't lead. And here's an example I'll give, and I'm sure, Jason, you've got dozens and hundreds of examples. I, I have people that I've worked with in the past in senior leadership roles. If they are not aware, and by the way, I've learned this lesson a hard way. If you're not aware of what's going through the minds of the people in the room that you're trying to lead, you can't lead them. It doesn't mean you need to do what everybody wants. Right. But if you don't understand emotionally and intelligently where they are coming from, you can't appropriately lead them because you have to reach them. Ultimately, the team needs to be successful. So you've got to figure out how to get Johnny, Joey, Billy, and Joan to focus on the mission, put their differences aside and follow you. And by the way, that means you have to interface and you guys described this book with each one of them very differently. The same size doesn't fit all. That's right. So when, when you guys talk to um, a leader and this gets into human resources as well as it does just oh, plain out leadership. No question. No question. Yeah. Let's break it down from mission and the tactics for a minute. Mm -hmm. what's your advice to a leader and what's your point of view to get them to understand and buy into the mission? And what that means is maybe they don't necessarily all agree with it, but how do you get that buy in to say, we're going to go accomplish it? So we talk about that in the book and, and part of the reason why I was inspired to start mission six zero is, is because a friend of mine who had started a business, uh, a security company, he was making mm -hmm. tons and tons of money. And we were sitting on the couch one day and he was just kind of rubbing his, his, his forehead, you know, and he was just like, man, I'm so frustrated. And I was like, what's the deal? And he's like, I believe in my company so passionately. Like I want this thing to succeed. Like a lot of times my check, my paycheck, I put it right back in the company mm -hmm. so we can continue moving forward and doing great things. But my guys don't believe in my company as much as I do. And he's like, granted, I'm the founder and I know they're not going to get to my level, but yep. how do I get them to buy into me and buy into the company? And I thought about it for, for a little while. I was like, man, that's, his name was Steve. I was like, man, that's an interesting question. And as we started Mission Zig Zero and we started to see, you know, how we do this, we, we were like, you know what? It's, it's really all about a, a two-way street with buy-in. If you want people to buy into you or buy into your company, you have to take that uncomfortable leap of faith and buy into them first. So you have to sit down with them, have that emotional intelligence and yeah. say, why are you here? Do you have the self-awareness and the social awareness and the situational awareness? What's your vision? What do you want to accomplish with your life? Mm -hmm. And once you get that from them, you can say, all right, well, let me be an asset for you. I'll help you 
accomplish your vision and your mission and your mission. But right now I need you to take that uncomfortable leap of faith as well and buy into me and believe in me. And for me, these are my values. And for me, this is the list of priorities, mission, team, teammate, self. If we can get on the same page with that, we can do great things. And I'll tell you Pete, one more, one more story. Cause you fired me up with this one. Um, my buddy Cameron, he lives out here in Utah. And when I was getting married about five years ago, I asked him, he's been married for almost 18 years, you know, and he's got kids and four kids, I think. And, uh, I was like, got any advice for me? And he's like, oh man, marriage is easy. Let me tell you, here's what you got to do. You know, and I just kind of listened to him and kind of laughed about it, whatever. And, and uh, a few months ago, just before COVID hit and we were sitting down and, um, at lunch and, uh, I'm like, how's everything going? He's like, man, this is terrible, terrible, man. Like, well, what's up, you know? And he's like, I'm getting a divorce. Oh, heartbreaking. <laughs> like, bro, like I thought you guys were great. You got four kids. Everything is going, you're, you're like the, the, the model. Right? Yeah. You know? And he was like, I'm shocked. You know, I, it's not my decision. Well, do you mind if I ask what happened? And he's like, I came home from work, walked into the kitchen. My wife was in there and the kids were kind of running around and she sort of matter of factly just said, you know, I want a divorce. And I thought she was joking. And, and she said, you know, it's over and I'm leaving you. And by the way, I've been cheating on you for a year. And <sighs> realized she wasn't kidding and, and he took it seriously and he didn't know how to react. So he started to panic and he started to beg and he, I'll go to counseling. I'll do whatever it takes. Please let's work on this. Like we've been married for 18 years. And she started just coldly walking away from him to the door. And he saw that her bags were already packed by the door. She picked up her bags. He followed her out, begging her to come back the whole time. And she got into her truck and, and he was standing there and, and she kind of rolled down the window and she said, okay, you know, for our kids sake, I'll come back to you. I'll give you one chance. I'll come back to you. If you can tell me what my vision is for my life, what have I always wanted to do with my life? If you can tell me that right now, I'll stay. And Cameron just looked at her and he was like, I, I don't know. And she rolled up the window and drove away. And Cameron and I were sitting down and he's like, remember when I told you that marriage was easy? And I was like, yeah, man, I remember that. He's like, well, it was easy for me, but it wasn't easy for her. And so he didn't take that time to have those conversations, to have that display, that emotional intelligence, to have that emotional dexterity to say, let me focus on you. What is your vision? What do you want to accomplish with your life? And let me help you accomplish that. And so in a way he was, absent from that relationship for 18 years and she had enough of it that is uh well first of all it's heartbreaking but it's a great analogy it's a great it's a great way to compare this to what we're all dealing with in the workplace i noticed that every time you did meet one of the people that major pettit wanted you to meet they all asked you that question and they said jason why are you here what can I do to help you? And, and every one of them said, I want to help you be a better leader. I want you to help. And by the way, they said to you, and I think it was one of the training missions that one of the guys was talking about. No, your job isn't for you to do better. Your job is to help your teammate do better on that, on that yeah. op, that practice op. So I, I'm, I, by the way, these are things I like to think that I do well, but I could always do better. I do deeply care about my team. They know I care about them. I don't know that I do this adequately, you said something very interesting, which is you have to extend that trust initially, yeah. right? You don't have any experience or time with that person to make it determine either way. You have to offer it first, trust and then verify, right? So you have everybody, by the way, they're doing the same thing with you, right? Your team, when you took that, that group over, they don't know you from Adam. Yeah. I can't demand you trust me. That doesn't work like that. That you've got to earn it over time. Yep. And that means that when you're working with an organization, you have to work at the top, but then you have to teach that person how to work with their team to build trust and ask them what they'd like to accomplish. Then you got to train them to do that with their team. Because if this doesn't translate all the way down from the top, you, you've lost, right? Everybody wow. has to feel that way, which requires a very different way of thinking. There are some people, and I believe organizations are going to have to rethink how they lead because the workforce is different. You know, when my dad and your dad, went to work, they went to work for a company and did whatever they told them for 50 years and they retired. People don't think that way. There's a lot more mobility. There's more opportunity. 
and people can hop around and they don't necessarily want to, you know, you, the, the bond you formed with your teams, you talked about it, how, when you went back to this, you know, the, the, the different groups you were in, there was just instant camaraderie, instant respect. And that loyalty is there. There are people that I've worked with 30 years ago who I could pick up the phone right now and have a conversation like we hadn't, you know, like we hadn't missed a beat. I know exactly what right. you're talking about. And there are not a lot of them. Five to 10 people where I would trust with anything I needed to do at work and I would trust my kids with them. That's a small circle. Mm-hmm. Now, I haven't, I haven't been to war with people. I think if, you're, if you know somebody's going to defend themselves, defend your life, you know, it's not, that's a whole different level of trust. I don't have that book to tap into. But I'm, I'm trying to think about how you help an organization. We've talked about driving mission, driving strategy. And I'll tell you what, do I would companies struggle defining their mission? Yeah. Right. I mean, it, you see mission and vision and values and you read them sometimes you're like, has anybody looked at this in 20 years? <laughs> yeah, that's true. There's a consulting group right there. If, if you just could help companies figure that out, that would be huge. So mission six zero. I mean, I, I've gone through this exercise with some companies. We've produced some good ones. But when I watch the leadership roll it out to the employees, they're all like, yeah, whatever. Like, you don't even believe it. Why are we doing this? Right. It's maybe hard to define a mission for a company that produces televisions. <laughs> but they need one. I couldn't agree with you more. You know, right. like, you can't force it. You know, it takes time. And what we talk about in, in chapter three of the book is the importance of values. Yes. You know, find out who you are as a person, what you value. Because when you start talking about your values, then you start to get passionate. Then you start to get excited. Mm-hmm. Then you start to get buy-in. Like for me, you know, the, 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 uh, the exercises, you know, in the back of the book, we've got 200, 300 different types of values. Yes. And you start picking the ones that resonate with you. And then you kind of whittle that down to three to five values. Uh, We go with three in my company at Mission Six Zero. And we say, this is what means, these are the values that mean the most um, to me personally. This Mm -hmm. is what I'm all about. And it's interesting to see what values resonate with which guys. Like for me, my three values are determination, resourcefulness, and loyalty. Okay. So when, when guys show up that are determined, resourceful, and loyal, like I, Hey, we're buds. I resonate with you big time. And other guys on the team, you know, they have different values. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. I wouldn't have pegged you for those values. But now that I know that that's what you value most, I can treat you accordingly. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, and I think it, when we go to clients, one of the first things we do is talk to the decision makers, the guys that are the leaders in the company. And we say, what are your values? And we work through that. And then, as you said, just develop a mission statement based on, based on that. Yeah, that's really important. I, I'm, I'm blessed. The company I work with right now, and it's sort of the, the advertising group that I work with, there's a, it's probably one of the few companies I've worked with where I actually like every single person in the company. That's amazing. Don't it's, leave that company, man. That's a great thing to have. It, it's, uh, it's remarkable, right, where you, you don't get off a call or out of a meeting and go, oh, killing me. It doesn't happen. Right. Everyone seems to... They did, some, they did a good job hiring. The people that are in the roles that are in like what they're doing. They're passionate about the technology or the science. You know, and, and you're right. You have to understand what those values are. It doesn't mean we have, don't have our flaws and our imperfections. We're trying to get yeah. better. But, man, if you can align good people in a room, crazy things can happen. And then you got to figure out how to take that core and build the right mission. <laughs> right. So when you – when you talk to organizations, and again, this is probably a different discussion with an NFL football team like the Jets than it is with a company. Okay. How do you, what's the cycle? If you were, if you were to start from scratch and let's say we were to bring you in and say, hey, Jason, the Mission Six Zero team, we want you to help us understand our, our values and our mission. And then we want you to help translate that into a strategy that our company can then go implement. What does that cycle look like? Um, what's the process? How would, you know, like literally walk me through the tactics. All right, Pete, we spend three weeks evaluating these attributes of values and mission. 
And then once we had that down, then we run into six different workshops that break down a strategic plans for each one of the business units. And then we help them. What's that process like? It, it's different for everybody. Sure. You know, and that's the best answer I could give you. Um, uh, kind of a basic answer would be, you know, we come in and we have a very intimate conversation, very open, very vulnerable conversation with you guys, the decision makers about what you want to accomplish, uh, where you're at right now, what challenges you're facing and so forth. Mm -hmm. If we have the time, we kind of go out into the, the kind of employee base mm -hmm. and we get to know them. We ask them questions. We do surveys in person. You know, sometimes clients will say, we don't want you to tell them who you are and what you're doing. We just want you to gather information. And other times we'll go in there and just say, hey, we're with Mission Six Zero, and I'm just going to ask you some questions. Oftentimes at work, people aren't going to tell you much. But no. as soon as you take them out of the office, let's go grab a, a drink. Let's go to dinner. Sure. They open up, man. They feel comfortable. And you'd be surprised how quickly people will just tell you what they think. Yeah. You know, we work with some, some NFL teams where we worked with the business side and they were just like, Oh, we hate the coaches. We hate the head coach. We're trying to get him fired. You know? And it's just like, okay, well, you probably don't realize I work for the head coach, but I'm, I'm taking these notes down, you know, like, and I'll, and I'll let him know. And then <laughs> tomorrow what's going on guys telling me, Oh, we've got a spy in the, in the, uh, the office spying on the coach. Great information to have. Thanks for that. You know, um, but we try to, you know, let people know that, you know, we're here to, to help. We're not here to, to hurt, you know, and, and we get all this information. We sit down with the decision makers and we say, all right, listen, this is where we view you. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? And, you know, they agree or disagree. And, and we have a discussion about that. And then we put together sort of a custom program for them. Uh, oftentimes we like for them to kind of digest our material deliver discomfort, go through the master class. We do a train the trainer sort of model. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, it kind of goes from there. And, and I think people forget, or people that are not familiar with the military, the level of training you guys go through to perfect your craft, right? And, and that's where I think a lot of organizations miss the boat, right? They'll have this, they might bring in a consultant. The consultant can tell them, by the way, a lot of regular consultants have this ready to go in their back pocket, right? They know what they're going to see and they're going to throw out some standard ideas and suggestions, but turning it into an action plan is where I think you guys bring something different to the table. You're not afraid to put the work in because you also know how important the work is to perform in battle. It can't be a thought process. It needs to be a, re a reflex, right? It needs to happen automatically. Now you may have a plan, the plan screwed the first time somebody fires a weapon, everything changes. And there's so much in the book about how people, but still they fell back on their training. They fell back on their values, why they were there to get through those tough situations. And I think people forget that work is just, is, is a, is a lesser version of this, right? I mean, I, I, we had a strategy in January and then COVID hit and that strategy is shit has done. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And our employees are like, well, what do we do? So we're trying to figure it out on a daily basis and it's still changing. Yeah. But if you're resilient, you get up in the morning and go, Hey, bring it on. Right. It, we're in this together. We'll figure it out. I think helping organizations go from the strategy or the concept of what you guys are describing into something that's tactical can be a real opportunity for the mission six zero team, which is, Hey, we didn't just design missions, but right? you talked about the PowerPoint. I got to go tell you what I plan on doing and who the team is. We went and did this shit. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Like yeah. We, we walk the walk. We don't just talk the talk. And, and I'll tell you, the way that we do it is, is like this. Um, we have veterans on the team. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable veterans with unbelievable experiences. Medal of Honor recipients, wounded veterans, Marines, Rangers, Green Berets, Navy SEALs, the, the, whole, the whole gamut. Guys that have been there, done that. You read a lot about those veterans in the book. Mm-hmm. When I first started bringing some of these veterans out to clients, we didn't have a scientific piece. We just had the veterans. And I remember one client was like, you know, to one of my vets during the Q&A portion, hey, I really like how you did that. Can you tell me how you did that so I can apply it to the business? Mm -hmm. And it kind of stumped them. 
a little bit. And he just kind of like looked at me and he was like, well, wow. and he answered the question like this pretty much. Well, I don't know. I, I just, I just did it. I just yeah. relied on my training and the person in the audience sort of just kind of, you know, gave him a little bit of a, uh, that, that answer is just not going to cut it for me. Yeah. You know? And I thought to myself, we're missing a huge opportunity here. We need to be more than just a motivational, inspirational, you know, group. We can really help people and I want to help people and I don't want to give you a one size fits all, you know, approach. I want to actually help you accomplish whatever it is that you want to accomplish. So to do that, I brought in scientists, PhDs, researchers, experts, you know, and so forth. And I said, guys, if there's a way that we can combine the SOF, Special Operations Forces, with the science, we can be do, doing something really spectacular. So that's how we train folks. And that's how the book is constructed that you alluded to earlier. It's, it's a story about a veteran, mm-hmm. right? And then we take that and we say, here's the so what and the now what behind this experience. Here's how you can take this and apply it to your personal or your professional life in a very relatable and digestible way. And oh, by the way, you know, we've been in business for nine years now and we have some, some really interesting business stories. And so let me give you a practical application after all this is done so that it might help you understand how I can implement this in the future. And uh, that's how we teach and, and that's how the book is constructed. You know, I, this, is, this is a couple of things that resonated with me as I was reading the book. Our, we have a, a chief financial officer who's a former GE guy. We both worked at GE together. Nice. And his big question is when, he, when we put a slide up is so what? Right. And you've got it right in the book, right? Which is so what? So, you know, there's what I've liked. And we talked about this before we actually started recording. It's the first time I've seen a collection of very compelling stories with a, with a common narrative all the way through them. Then you have the, the, the credentialed scientists, people come in and say, hey, look, that's great. Here's how somebody with extreme training in extreme search, you know, circumstances came through that situation. But here's why they were able to do that. Here's the science behind the training, the chemistry in their brain and their body that allowed them to do that, how they were able to tap into their values and their emotional intelligence. And here's where they ran up against right up to the edge and almost didn't get there, but fell back into some sort of training. And, and then you come back in after that and you talk about how you've applied that in a business case, which is great. You're kind of like, all right, so what? And then now what is, what do we do with this information? I can envision, like we talked about the second book, where almost all these situations are business related, right? Yeah. You do a quick narrative about here's what happened with so-and-so. And guess what? Now we have four companies that have gone through this training and done this. And this is what's happened with those organizations. Because then idiots like me go, I can totally relate to that. You know, I, my company's like like XYZ organization. I can't relate relate to Joe Cerna because the dude's a badass. Right? <laughs> I'm a yeah. dad in North Carolina. I, I can't aspire to that. But you've given me a playbook, right? You've given me the science that I can walk this into my organization. It's rare that I read a book, Jason, I told you, where I dog-eared the whole thing, scribbled stuff. I was taking pictures of pages on Saturday mornings at 6 a.m. and texting my team and said, read yes. this page. Read this page right here. This is what we need to do. And I do that. They know on Saturdays they get something, either uh, an article or a book or something from me that says, hey, let's pay attention to this. Let's incorporate this in our training as you're talking to a customer. and Think about this. This is the first time I said this is something we need to do, right? As leaders, we need to figure out how to – change the way we think about our conversations with our employees and our customers. So, you know, when, and I want to wrap this up cause you're a busy guy and you've got more people to go help train, but I'll tell you, this has been incredibly enjoyable. I've loved every second of it. So well, thanks for having the show. It's, it's awesome. It's an honor. And it's also just kind of a privilege to, to be able to speak with you guys. One of the things that I wanted to focus on that, that I want to wrap up, um, and, and you and I talked about how do we help organizations who might be nervous about, wow, this book's called the deliberate discomfort. We don't want our people uncomfortable. How do we help them understand what this really means? And what we talked about, and I'm going to help try to in, in the, in the comments, of the post, when I publicize this podcast is the only time you learn is when you are uncomfortable, right? It, it, if we all knew everything, there would be no discomfort. But when you're in a situation where you're like, I don't really know the answer to that. That's uncomfortable right? Or a customer catches the problem you weren't aware of, you're in a tough situation. That's when you start to learn and grow and become a better leader. And you guys break down the science between, you know, EDSOC, right? Which is 
the chemicals that your body is reacting to or bringing on or firing in to help you react to these situations. It's just science. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm presenting in front of, I just got off this before we started this, I did a presentation for 350 different people and I was the last presenter. I've done a lot of those. So it wasn't really nerve wracking, but I don't know what they're thinking. Yeah. And they, they asked me, home, are they ready to like check their watches? Well, they were probably ready to go home and check their watches. <laughs> and you can't tell when you're on a zoom call, you can't tell they're all rolling their eyes, but they started firing some questions that I wasn't prepared for. All right. So I took a deep breath and thought, all right, I'll fire off what I think is a decent answer, but I'll tell them at some point, you know what, that's something I don't quite understand, but take that person's name down and I'll get back to them. Mm. You know, just diffuse the situation. Sometimes saying you don't know is a really good way to handle it. The last thing I want to talk about, and this is something that um, entrepreneurs and leaders need to think about. You talk about this service triangle in the book. Yeah. Right? Everything is about serving the person next to you. Yeah. That is so powerful and it is not a normal thought process. When you are an entrepreneur and you're building a small organization, the level of impact a bad employee can have or you as a bad leader can have is catastrophic. It's X factored. X so factors. when you're bringing in a small team and you've got this service factor, which is, you know, I won't go into the science panels on page 151. I, I've read some stories about the selection process the military has for almost any position, but certainly special operations and special forces. How would you apply what you've learned through that process to building teams? What should people be looking for? What kind of patience? I mean, hire slow, fire fast is, is a model that probably has some merit. When you think about serving others, what are you looking for in teammates that shows you they're somebody that would serve with you and you want to serve with them, Jason? That's a great call. And I talk about that in the book as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, really day one of selection, special forces selection, right? Okay. We did a log PT, you know, and so all of the candidates went outside <clears throat> on the rocks. We held these big 300, 400 pound logs over our heads as a team, right? Mm -hmm. And we pull them to our shoulders. We do bicep curls. We do inverted push ups. We do relay races with these logs. And we'll hold these rocks, logs for hours and hours and hours. <clears throat> when we first start, everybody's excited. Come on, Pete, let's go, man. We can do this. Everyone's mm -hmm. 15, 20 minutes into it, you know, it sucks. And people are quiet and you just hear grunting and some people are throwing up and just breathing hard. And the instructors are, you know, knife edging you and getting really hard into, into this. And, and you start to think internally. You start to think about yourself. And you start to think, man, this sucks. Why am I doing this? Do I have what it takes? When is this all going to end? You know, and, and for whatever reason, and it's counterintuitive, like you said, it doesn't make sense. Instead of spending energy on myself, I decided to spend my energy externally. So I lifted my head up for whatever reason, mm -hmm. and I just looked around. And I saw everybody else struggling just as bad as, if not worse than me. And I saw another team just off, just not too far from, from where we were at holding the log. And I saw a buddy of mine, Pat, and he looked up and we made eye contact. We both kind of laughed and smirked a little bit like, man, this, this is day one. Yeah. You know, this sucks, man. And he just said simply, let's go, Jay. You got this. Only words that were said. And I said, let's go, Pat. That's it. And all of a sudden, other people started lifting their heads up and looking at me and Pat. And they started laughing. And then we started saying, you know, supportive things to each other. And when we started doing that, when we started focusing on other people, we realized that the log started to get lighter. The time started to fly by. Um, we weren't sucking as bad. Now, the log, did the log get lighter? No. no. It was still hot out. We we're still sweating. We we're still panting. But when we focus on other people, we realized that that was the secret to getting through special forces selection and qualification course. And I'll tell you, on the very last day, donning our green berets, uh, just before we were about to don our green berets, we're all in formation. I looked at the people around me, to my left and to right in front of me, behind me. And it just occurred to me, I was like, wow, the guys that are in formation with me right now are all the guys that looked up on day one. All those wow. guys that didn't look up are gone because they were focused on themselves. 
How can this help me personally? What's in it for me? How is this going to make me rich? How is this going to do this for me? Those guys were out. And the guys had all said, what can I do for my buddy over here? What can I do for him? How can I serve this guy? How can I make his life easier? Those were the guys that made it. And that's the same thing in life. And we can take that same mentality in business and life. We're going to be successful as as a company, as a team, as a country, you know, they, that's, that's the secret. And it's counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense, but service, having that service mindset is the key. You know, I always like to wrap up these things with a very salient point. You've given me the best one I've ever had in the podcast, right? So it's a punchline. And I, and I also remind my, my guests that <laughs> I'm looking for the title of this thing as I'm listening. Nice. And you gave it to me, which is I looked up. I looked up. Right. That's the title. And, you know, you do just, by the way, it's, it's a powerful part of the book when you describe this. It, it, it kind of sets the, uh, it describes a lot of who you are, Jason, as a person and as a leader. But what I really enjoyed, every one of the people you met in the book could relate to that moment. Yeah. And they all had, I, it's interesting. There are a couple themes in every one that you spoke to in the book. And by the way, I have to believe that the narrative and the conversations are as accurate as possible. Yeah, they're but pretty I, accurate. I mean, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, artistic license there, but they're, they're as much as I can of, remember. And yeah, some and, uh, of the stuff happened years ago, yeah, right? Yeah. But what I like about it is there is a tremendous amount of respect in every conversation that you had in that book. Guys oh, yeah. teasing each other, all that stuff happens in their unit. But when the serious shit happened and you know, the major wanted you to meet with these other leaders, they took that extremely seriously. They took helping you be successful very seriously. And when you talk about looking up and the other people looked up and said, how can I help the people around me be better? That is a mentality you've got to weave into every team in every organization is no, your job is to help your team be better. Cause if we accomplish the mission, Everything else will come along. If the mission's accomplished, everything else happens. So, you know, Jason, I, we could do four hours of this. I, I would, I would oh, not yeah. be able to stop talking because yeah. I, Goodbye. Goodbye. oh yeah, I, I, I was going through the book in you know, the last couple of days, and I thought I, I took six pages. I'm like, I can't do, I can't do this to Jason. I got to pick one. I got to pick one area <laughs> and drill into it. Fair enough. So, brother, I'm, I'm honored that you took the time to speak with us. Please. Uh, you know, in your conversations with the mess, rest of the people in the book and the Mission Six or team, just let them know how grateful we are for their service and their sacrifice and their leadership. And I look forward to, I just look forward to working with you again. Hell yeah. Much appreciated. Same here. Uh, I look forward to the next time. It's been a blast. A pleasure. It's an we'll honor. Do, we'll do another one for sure. Jason, again, thanks much. And I appreciate you being a guest in the show. Cool. Thanks for checking out Eating Crow. Like and subscribe so you never miss a video.